Hey, uh, greetings. This is uh, Mike Jones, Professor Jones, Professor Mike, Mike Jones, Mike, however you want to refer to me. Uh, this is Chapter 4. We're going to talk about Chapter 4 in the McKinley textbook on anatomy and physiology. This is all about cells. This is really going to be broken into three sections or three subsections, if you like. Uh, First is we're going to talk about cells, what cells are, and their organelles. They are a system like a body is a system. Your body has kidneys and a heart and lungs and all these separate organs that do something in relation to the, to the whole. Cells themselves are similar to that. They have organelles, smaller organs, if you will, inside a cell that perform specific functions for that cell to keep it alive, to keep it uh, moving, if the case may be, to keep it replicating, as the case may be. Whatever is necessary for the cell to, to live and thrive, it has organelles. But cells themselves are microscopic. You're learning this in lab. They're small. Some of them are bigger than others, but they're all small. I'm going to adjust my camera here. The other thing you should be aware of is that I'm uh, having some really bad allergy issues. And um, so I sound like I'm really stuffed up and my eyes are tearing up like crazy. And it's just a horrible allergy day. <clears throat> but we'll press forward. So, yeah, cells are the basic units of the body, right? Uh, living things, certainly eukaryotes. And eukaryotes are are us. Ah, my computer's sending me messages. No, thank you. Not right now. Eukaryotes are what we are. Uh, that means that we have a cell membrane, so that separates the cell from the rest of everything else. And inside that cell is a nucleus, a separate area where we store the DNA that is so essential to uh, maintaining a cell and to doing cellular functions. And we're going to talk all about that in a bit. So cells are small. Now, cells also are very, very specialized. Almost every cell in your body has a very special function, a very special task. Uh, there are un what are referred to as undifferentiated cells. Uh, you'll see this thing up here that says, cells have to be differentiated. That's a specialized cell. That means the cell has a specific function and it doesn't do the functions of other cells. So your cardiac cells are specific to your heart and your kidney cells are specific to your kidney and they do separate functions because they are differentiated. A differentiated cell can't go backwards. Once a cell specializes, it doesn't unspecialize. Now there are some what we refer to as undifferentiated cells, cells that have uh, the ability to become many, many different kinds of cells. The ultimate cell there is called the stem cell. And there are different kinds of stem cells, but generally speaking, a stem cell can become many, many different cells in your body. If they do that, they become differentiated. Uh, differentiation is a process that, that specializes cells, but it also can change the shape of the cell. It can change the appearance of the cell. We're going to talk all about those different appearances and those different shapes and what, what they mean and what they have to do. But let's talk about a cell as a basic unit of the body. All right. So let me put this full screen <clears throat> so it's a little easier to see. Right. There we are. Okay. Next up. So cells are the basic units of the body. But look at these different cells. There's a lot of different shapes and kinds of cells. Because, oh, where did I go? There I am. Ha, ha, ha. Um, so these cells, the cells can range in size from, here's a red blood cell. The red blood cell is up here, very tiny. These are some of the smallest cells of the body. Seven and a half micrometers. That means micrometers, one millionth of a meter across. So they're tiny. Uh, versus, say, something like an egg. Uh, uh, we'll learn later in the semester. It's a secondary oocyte. But for our purposes here, we'll call it an egg. An egg cell is up to 140 micrometers long. That is 20 times bigger. 
and then they take on these weird appearances, right? The nerve cell has these funky little spiky things sticking out of it and long slender things coming out of it. We're going to talk all about those things. Some cells appear flat in shape, like a sheet. <clears throat> this would be very uh, uh, important in, say, your epidermis and your skin. And then you have this, these are cardiac muscle cells that are strung together in such a way that they will contract together. Uh, so, specialization. Every cell, every cell of your body, um, I'm going to say every cell, and then I'm going to give you a caveat to that description. Uh, but every cell has these three components to it, mammalian cells. I mean, we're talking about humans because this is a human, human anatomy and physiology course. So we're going to focus in on humans. Your, your dog and cat and gerbil follow along with the same sort of thing. Uh, three major parts of the cell, right? But I'm going to start at the bottom. There's a cell membrane. A cell membrane is vital. Absolutely vital. Uh, the next thing is there is fluid inside the cell called cytoplasm. And there's more than just fluid, but we'll, we'll say that's predominantly the fluid portion of a cell is cytoplasm. And then there's this thing called a nucleus. A nucleus houses off and separates out the DNA uh, in a eukaryotic cell uh, versus, say, a bacteria. Bacteria don't wall off their DNA from the rest of the cell. So we have to talk about the organelles, and we have to talk about the fluid. The fluid portion of the cell uh, is called cytosol, and we're going to get into these specific definitions next. All right, here's a picture of a cell. This cell, <laughs> there's no cell actually like this cell anywhere in your body. This cell has every single feature that any cell could ever have. Uh, <clears throat> which means that no cell actually looks like this cell. Now I'll start with the most unique feature here. The most unique feature is this thing up here, a flagellum. A flagellum is only found in one mammalian cell, and that is a sperm cell. A flagellum is a propulsive tail. Uh, it's a way that the sperm cell can move from one point to another point. It works like muscle. There are some similarities to how, to how muscles contract and how a flagellum works, but only one cell. Let me emphasize that this makes for great test questions. Are you are you writing this down right now? It makes for direct, great test questions to say, um, all cells have the following things, except, except a flagellum. There's one cell that has a flagellum, that's a sperm cell. Other than that, there are many other cells that have many of the other attributes that this generic cell has. We're going to talk about a lot of these features in, in more detail, but this is, this is, if you look at all of this stuff, you should be able to name every uh, every structure that is named on here on this cell, and they and it will represent a test question or a potential test question in the future. <clears throat> so let's talk about it in a little bit more detail. First thing, um, a plasma membrane, cell membrane. Uh, a cell membrane is the outer boundary of the cell. That just means uh, the outside of a cell. Is called a membrane and it separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell and it is not too much to say that this is forms the basis of life itself that cells have to have a separate internal environment from the that is different than the outside environment and the way it is able to do that is it has a border and this border is called a cell membrane. Now, the other thing that a cell membrane has to be able to do for a cell is it has to be able to interact with the outside world. It can't just simply separate out the inside world from the outside world. It has to be able to interact with the outside world. And it does so by what doing the, having a property that we refer to as selectively permeable. Permeability is a, uh, um, you could, Think of it as a leaky membrane. If something is leaky, it's permeable. If something is not leaky and something and, and, and it creates an impenetrable border, we would call that impermeable. 
cell membranes can't be like that. They have to be permeable. But they can only, they only want to allow certain things in and certain things out. And they want to decide what comes in and what goes out. So we refer to that as selectively permeable. So cell membranes in mammals and eukaryotic cells are selectively permeable. Uh, signal transduction simply means we are communicating with the outside world. So if you're in the cell, you have a, you have a way to communicate with the outside and the outside world has a way to communicate with the inside of the cell. That's called sig signal transduction. Now, the other thing that I want you to come away with this, this lecture, this talk, is the idea that a cell membrane is mostly made of a fatty layer. And fats, um, uh, something we're going to learn later, we're going to talk about in the third part of this talk, we're going to talk about um, how fats and uh, uh, other solutions interact with each other. So this is the, the way to encapsulate this, the way to make it easy to, for you to understand or to, to, to see where we're going with this is you know that fats and or I'm sorry that water and oil doesn't mix. So go to your cupboard. Uh, I'm serious. Go to your cupboard. Grab some vegetable oil or olive oil or whatever you have. I'm sure you have some kind of oil up there. Um, you have coconut oil or something, right? Uh, try to find a liquid oil. Put a little bit in a glass, and then put water on top of it. <clears throat> now I know you probably don't have to do this, but what you're going to end up with is an oil layer and a water layer. And they're not going to mix together. Now, if you were to shake that container or swirl it around or put a you know fork in there and whip it around, you would find there was some intermixing. But then eventually they're going to sort themselves out again. You're going to have a water layer and an oil layer. That's a cell membrane. A cell membrane is like that oil layer. It doesn't let things in uh, that are not compatible with an oil layer. So we're going to see that. All right, the, the structure of a cell membrane. Oops, I got to move the because I'm in the way again here. Uh, a cell membrane is formed of what we call a phospholipid bilayer. Uh, we're going to see pictures in a moment. A bilayer means there's two layers. Bi, two. Two layers of fatty acids or phospholipids in this case, and they are arranged head to tail. In a cell membrane, you'll see you'll see pictures of this in a moment. Most of that membrane is formed of this material that I told you that doesn't doesn't like to mix with water, and there's a special term for that. We call that hydrophobic. If something is hydrophobic; it doesn't mix with water, it doesn't like water. Phobic means it's fear; it has a fear of water. I'm not sure that you know lipids actually fear water. I don't think they have that capability, but all right. We call them hydrophobic. On the other hand, on the outside of, of this bilayer are these phosphate molecules, and you'll see those in a minute, and they do actually have a charge to them, um, and they are hydrophilic. So they like water. So it turns out that, that, that a cell membrane, while it acts mostly like a fatty layer, it actually has this other, layer, other uh, portion to it on the outside and the inside of the cell that does like water. So, uh, so a, a cell membrane is this weird concoction of a, uh, a lipid barrier, a fatty layer barrier to the outside world, but it also can interact with water because of, these, of this hydrophilic phosphate outside, uh, the outside of the cell and on the inside of the cell. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, concoction of these two things. Right, so it's permeable to lipid soluble substances. So, in the in the in, in the end, what you need to understand is things that are nonpolar, nonpolar molecules. We just went through this whole part about talking about polar and nonpolar molecules. Ions are polar. There are polar molecules. Ions uh, don't like or can't interact with nonpolar materials. So most of the cell membrane is nonpolar. So if an ion tries to get through a cell membrane, it cannot do that. That means the membrane is selectively permeable, or, or I guess in that case, selectively impermeable to ions. Sodium ion, potassium ion, calcium ion, they cannot get in. 
unless they are invited in. Remember that because they will be invited in. There are other ways to get them in. But as it sits, ions can't get in. Polar molecules cannot get in or get out if there's polar molecules inside the cytoplasm. They can't get out. Now, things that are fat soluble, like, for example, cholesterol. Cholesterol is in your diet. You also make cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fatty substance. It's a, it's a lipid or a lipid soluble substance. It can easily trans, transfer through the membrane or remain in the membrane to stabilize the membrane. Uh, we have this thing called a fluid mosaic model. Now, that's a, that's a weird term. So yeah, you have this idea of this membrane that's made of fats predominantly that has this weird outer part of it that actually likes water, but the inner part of it doesn't like water. <clears throat> but inside that membrane are proteins. Proteins, so certain kinds of proteins can float around inside that cell membrane, and they're built in such a way that they can do that. It's an extremely important process or extremely important aspect of cell membranes that you have to understand. That whole idea is called a fluid mosaic model, meaning you got this fatty, fluidy layer, and there are some proteins that stick inside that membrane, and they float around inside that membrane to do special functions of the cell. Some of those special functions are they form pores, or they form channels, or they create receptors, or there are enzymes in that in in that in those proteins. They identify other molecules that may come around and bump into our into the cell. So let's let's look at that. All right. So we take our basic cell model that we had in a couple slides ago. We enlarge one part of it. We enlarge that part. So now here's the inside of the cell over there, and this is the outside of the cell. So the cell membrane separates inside from outside. That's life itself. I am not kidding you. I am not overstating the case. This is what allows life to exist, the separation from inside to outside. All right, now we're going to magnify that again. We magnify it over here. Here's the inside. Here's the outside. Now what these things look like is they are a head-to-tail arrangement of a phospholipid. The phospho part is this rounded bit that we call the, the head that round bit, and on the inside is the tail. And the tail is made of long chains of fatty acids. And fatty acids are nothing more than carbons strung together in long chains. These can be 12, 14, 16, 18, 20 carbons long. And literally, these long carbon chains. And then they have a bunch of hydrogens also attached to them. That is a fatty acid. And there's another component to that too, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Right, so let's look at the next. Now here's the fluid mosaic thing that I was talking about. Again, here is the, oh, I gotta move me, I'm in the way. All right, so this is the outside of the cell. Anything outside the cell is called extracellular. Extracellular means outside the cell intracellular or cytoplasmic side. If we're talking about cytoplasm, we're talking about the inside of the cell. Here is the phosphate part, the, all these rounded little balls next to each other, all lined up, all smushed together. And on the inside is the fatty acid tail. Again, this is hydrophobic, so it does not like water. That's why it's on the inside of the membrane. And on the outside, you have the phosphate layer that does like water. On the, on the outside of the cell and on the inside of the cell, on the face of the inside. All right. And then all these little purple things are supposed to show you proteins that are just floating in that cell membrane. So we, we call this, we refer to this as the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes. You have proteins that go all the way through. These are called transmembrane. Trans means all the way through. Uh, you can have proteins that are on the just on the inside or just on the outside 
or go partway through or go all the way through. See, over here, this protein is forming a channel. It's going to be really, really important that you understand that there are ways to bring in ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride ions, lots of other ions. Uh, there are ways to bring in glucose into the cell. And that's because we have these proteins floating around inside this fluid mosaic model. Now these, now these proteins that are on there also have other things attached to them. They can have carbohydrates attached to them. That's what these little green things are. Little green things are supposed to indicate carbohydrates that are attached to the proteins. But the carbohydrates can also be attached to the lipid part of the cell membrane. And we call that a glycolipid. Anytime you see the word glyco, that means a carbohydrate, a sugar, if you will. So glyco, you can have glycoproteins. You can have glycolipids. There's lots of different ways that this can be arranged. All right. Now inside the cell, cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the fluid part of the inside of the cell. But when we talk about cytoplasm, we are talking about everything that is inside the cell. If we talk about cytoplasm, we're talking about all of the organelles, all, all of the things inside there, the separate organelles that we'll talk about in a moment, plus cytosol. And cytosol is the fluid stuff, the liquid inside it. Now, the liquid in there is mostly water, but there's a lot of stuff that's dissolved in that water. And that fluid portion is called cytosol. And the organs, the nucleus and mitochondria and all these things we're going to talk about, all those things are called organelles. So if you, if you talk about the organelles, if you talk about everything inside a cell membrane, you're talking about cytoplasm. If you're just talking about the fluid part, you're talking about cytosol. Now, having said that, what you're going to see is there's a lot of back and forth with this kind of uh, terminology. You're going to see where we'll talk about cytoplasm, but what we really mean is cytosol, the fluid part. And we'll go back and forth with that. So cytoplasm and cytosol are kind of interchangeable. The organelles are, are the, the organelles. We're, we're going to talk about those things. Inside, also, your cells have a skeleton. Just like you have a bony skeleton, so do your cells. Your cells have a cytoskeleton. Uh, these are protein rods. They're called microtubules. And they form a structural network to that cell to help it maintain its shape. And we're going to talk all about the shapes of the cells when we get to Chapter 5. All right. I promised organelles. Here they are. Let's start with moving me out of the way again. All right, ribosomes. Ribosomes are structures. Uh, they're fairly small by themselves. I mean, they're large molecules, but as organelles go, they're pretty small. Sometimes they can float freely in the cytoplasm. Sometimes they can be attached to another structure called endoplasmic reticulum, which we'll get to next. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, my throat is bothering me. <clears throat> Our ribosomes are composed of two things. They're composed of protein and they're composed of RNA. Now, we haven't really gotten to RNA very much, but we will. They can be floating around free in the cytoplasm, or they can be attached to this next thing called endoplasmic reticulum. Now, ribosomes are the structure. They're a machine. They're the molecular machine that converts uh, the message from DNA, converts it into a protein. They're the machines that do that. We're going to get to that process. Endoplasmic reticulum are these sacs or canals. You see this big thing here. There's just these folded sheets of a membrane inside the cell. Um, they serve as a transport system. And, we'll, and, and transport, when we, when we say transport, say for example, there's cells in your pancreas that make insulin. Insulin is a protein. Well, the cells that make that would have a lot of endoplasmic reticulum. They would make a lot of that protein, and this endoplasmic reticulum would help to uh, 
uh, encapsulate or, or encircle that in insulin that it had made in preparation uh, for sending it out of the cell to the rest of the body. Because insulin can't stay inside the pancreas, it has to get out into the bloodstream. And it's a hormone. This is how it does it. Now, there's two kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. If a ribosome is attached to it, we call that rough endoplasmic reticulum. If there is no ribosome attached to the ER, we call that smooth ER. All right, vesicles. Vesicles are just membranous sacs. They, they are meaning you have a phospholipid bilayer. Ah, yeah, yeah, I gotta move again. Yikes. There's a phospholipid bilayer inside the outer cell membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. And you're gonna say, oh my God. Yes, we can have multiple uh, vesicles that have a also have a phospholipid bilayer around them inside the cell. So these are used to transport substances around the, either around the cell itself or maybe to the outside of the cell. Uh, the Golgi apparatus, Golgi was named after a guy named Dr. Golgi. Uh, an apparatus, I always love that term. It's an apparatus. Why didn't we call it the Golgi sac? It's, it's actually sometimes called the Golgi body. These are Golgi bodies, Golgi apparatus. These are flattened sacs or flattened uh, uh, membranous sacs that are next to each other. They are used to, I told you about insulin. If your pancreas is making insulin, which it should be, I hope, if you're going to package up the insulin and send it outside the cell, it's going to go through a Golgi apparatus to do that. The Golgi apparatus will create a vesicle around uh, that insulin and that and in that case, and it will transport it to the outer cell membrane, and then it will uh, send out the insulin into the bloodstream. And that's how it does it through rough endoplasmic reticulum, through the Golgi bodies, Golgi apparatus, through the cell membrane of the outer part of the cell into the bloodstream. Uh, here's an example of an organelle interaction. Now they use milk secretion, that's fine. Um, if this were a, a mammary gland cell that was in the process of uh, producing milk for an infant, uh, the, uh, the code for the protein, for milk proteins, is stored in the DNA. The DNA sends that code out. We're going we're gonna to learn about how it does that. It sends the code out. Um, the protein is made in endoplasmic reticulum and then it is transported into the Golgi apparatus and then vesicles are made with it with the milk protein in it and that vesicle goes and attaches to the outer membrane of the cell and then the milk protein is spewed into the uh, into ducts that go to uh, the child who is suckling at that point so that's that's what these organelles do uh, to help um, get a protein to the outside of the body. Now, uh, all of the things that I just talked about, all that stuff requires energy. The cell has to have a source of energy and it has to be able to make its own energy. It has to have a power plant. Power plant's mitochondria. These are <clears throat> uh, organs, organelles, that are uh, they are they are a double a double membrane system, so they have an outer membrane, and then on the inside there is another membrane. Both of these membranes are phospholipid bilayers. It the 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 main purpose of mitochondria is to produce ATP. ATP is the cell money. You know that from uh, from the last chapter. We talked about how this is produced. ATP is predominantly produced inside mitochondria. Uh, it used to be 
millions and millions of years ago that mitochondria were their own individual organism living on their own. They were bacteria that lived on their own. And they uh, created a synergistic relationship with mammalian cells or to create mammalian cells or to create euka eukaryotic cells, actually, technically speaking. Um, it's good for the, uh, it's, it's good for the mitochondria. The mitochondria gets a home to live in and it gets all of its needs met. And the mitochondria produces ATP for the cell, which helps the cell meet its needs. So it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. All right. Again, we have other membranous sacs. These are going to be phospholipid bilayers, but inside this particular one called a lysosome, there are enzymes that digest waste products. You can think of these as the garbage uh, production facility or the garbage handling facility inside your cell. Um, Macrophages are full of lysosomes. Lysosomes, if a macrophage, and that's a particular kind of white blood cell, if that cell engulfs a bacteria, a lysosome will merge with the bacteria and digest the bacteria into its component pieces and then digest it all and uh, eradicate that bacteria. Um, it also does this for internal cell parts, if there are other cell parts in the body inside that cell that are worn out and need to be replaced or destroyed, a lysosome will do it. Peroxisomes are similar to that. Um, they tend to focus more on things like lipids, alcohol, and hydrogen peroxide. Those are waste products from some parts of metabolism. Um, so lysosomes and peroxisomes both are involved in kind of handling the cell's garbage. All right. I mentioned microtubules to you because they're part of the skeletal system that is on the inside of a cell. <clears throat> you have other structures that are called microfilaments. Microfilaments, microtubules will create the internal cell structure. So you're going to see when we get to chapter five, you're going to see some cells are flat. Some cells look like cubes. Some cells look like big, tall waste baskets that are called columnar cells. Those shapes of those cells are maintained by microfilaments and microtubules. Uh, in addition, uh, microfilaments and microtubules will, um, are involved in the re cell reproduction cycle, which is called mitosis. Very, very critical uh, uh, process uh, in order to allow, this, allow uh, DNA to migrate to either end of the new cell and for the cell to split itself. These structures are used in that as well. Uh, speaking of mitosis, a centrosome. Centrosome, it looks like this. Now, this is not, uh, centrosomes come in pairs like this. Um, one centrosome consists of two centrioles. So here's a centriole and here's another centriole. And they're always arranged in this kind of 90 degree pattern where one of them will be, you know, edge on and the other one will be at about 90 degrees to it, a little bit away from it. They're always organized like that. So when they travel through the cell, they travel together. The centrioles travel together um, to do their job. Now, when cells are going to go through mitosis, that means when the cell is going to divide or this is the weird thing where. You know, when we talk about cell multiplication or cell division, we're talking about the same thing, which doesn't work in math. You know that, right? When cells multiply, when you take one cell and you're going to make two cells, we call that multiplication. You're multiplying the cell. But we also call that the cell has to go through this process of cell division, which I know it's a little strange to say that. But for us, for biology, it's one and the same. Uh, this centrosome which is composed of two centrioles, will double up. So you will get two centrosomes in a cell that is just about to divide, go through a replication cycle. They're composed of microtubules. Uh, they're going to help to get chromosomes, get the, the uh, replicated chromosomes, uh, the same, same amount, same number, 
uh, of replicated chromosomes into each daughter cell in the end. Uh, cilia. Cilia are projections that come out of the top of the cell. They are what we refer to as motile. This word modal. That means they can move. They can move on their own. Now they move in a uh, coordinated fashion. Um, very, very common to have these kinds of cells, these kinds of organelles in the respiratory system where you will have a tall cell like this called a columnar cell and at the top of it will be cilia and other cells nearby will make um, mucus mucus will be spread across the top of the cilia and remember there's mi you know millions and millions of these cells all strung together so there's this whole ciliated layer with sticky mucus on it in the respiratory system. So when you breathe in, you're breathing in, like me, and breathing allergens, apparently, and or dirt or dust or whatever, and it goes into the respiratory system, and a lot of that stuff gets caught on the mucus, on the sticky mucus on top of the cilia. And now the cilia will work in a coordinated fashion to propel that dirty mucus either out of your nose or into your esophagus down into your stomach. These kind of cells, that's not the only place they're found. They're found in the respiratory tract. They're, they're also found in um, um, fallopian tubes where they will propel an egg, especially a uh, fertilized egg, toward the uterus. Um, so these are muscular things. Uh, muscular, I probably shouldn't say it that way. They are modal tissue. They can move. Flagella is another modal tissue. As I said, there's only one cell in mammals that has this, and it is sperm. Sperm have one flagella, flagellum, and they are to propel the sperm through the uterus, through the fallopian tube, to the awaiting egg, which is technically a secondary oocyte, but that's another story for another day. Um, so instead of having lots and lots of cilia at the cell, cell surface, you have one flagellum, and that flagellum acts as a propeller. Now, eukaryotes, and I mentioned that, prokaryotes are bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes. That means that they do not divide their nucleus from the rest of the cell. So their DNA is floating around inside the cytoplasm. We're, that's not how we do it. We wall off, we separate our DNA from the rest of the cell. So we create this thing called a nucleus. Around the outside of the nucleus is this thing called a nuclear pore, or nuclear envelope, sorry, nuclear envelope, in which there are pores, there are holes, essentially, where things can go in and come out. There are bodyguards at these nuclear pores, though, that do not allow DNA out of the nucleus. Uh, let me say it this way. The only time that DNA is found outside the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell is just before cell division, just before mitosis. The nuclear envelope will break down. The DNA <clears throat> will not then be in the cytoplasm of the cell, but only for a brief amount of time. And then the, nu then in the new cells, the nuclear envelope will reform and you'll have a nucleus where the DNA will be kept inside the nucleus, protected, safe. Uh, inside a nucleus is a denser object called a nucleolus. The nucleolus is where uh, ribosomes are made. The components of a ribosome are made in the nucleolus. And then they have to get out of the nucleus, and they can be escorted, and they have a way out. They can they can leave the nuclear pore into the cytoplasm. Chromatin. Chromatin is just what we call DNA that is unorganized. It's just, you know, 
spread out all over. This is DNA that's relaxed and it can, uh, you know, spread out throughout the cell. So that's referred to as chromatin. It's still DNA. It's still chromosomes, but it's not condensed chromatin. It's relaxed chromosomes. All the DNA in the cell is always kept inside the nucleus, except for the times that I told you just before mitosis. Okay, so that's that's a lot of the that sort of ends phase one or part one of this video. This is a good time to get up, move around, you know, do some jumping jacks. Uh, those are the organelles of importance. There are other organelles, of course. Those are the biggies. Now we're going to get into how do things get into the cell and out of the cell. I told you that the cell membrane, we think of this, I mean, even though it's composed of two bits, part of it is hydrophilic, part of it is hydrophobic. I really want you to think of a cell membrane as a hydrophobic thing, meaning if there is a polar molecule that is trying to get into the cell or out of the cell, it cannot do it on its own. It has to have a hole, a pore, or it has to be transported in or out. If a chemical is uh, hydrophilic, meaning it is fat soluble, so uh, steroid hormones are fat soluble, cholesterol is fat soluble, those kinds of things can slip through a cell membrane and they don't have to have a special pore, a special hole drilled into the cell membrane for them to get in and out. Everything else does, though. That's why we refer to this as a selectively permeable cell membrane. Okay, there's two ways that you can get things in and out. You can either uh, use energy to do it, and that would be an active process. Or you can do it without energy provided. And when I say energy, you've got to think ATP, 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 ATP. If I'm going to spend some money, I want to make it worth it. On the other hand, if I don't have to spend any money to get something in or out of my cell, I don't want to spend any money. Cells are pretty frugal. They're pretty cheap. They want to use processes to get things in and out the cheapest way possible. So these are the ways to do it. We're going to go through each one of these in the next few slides. All right. Now you have to understand this process called diffusion. Diffusion is a chemical process. This works for cells. It works for tea. It works for coffee when you put sugar in there. It works for whatever, you know, any fluid that you have ever had. Um, diffusion is a chemical property which takes certain things dissolved in a fluid and spreads them out evenly throughout the fluid. Uh, and it's a natural process. It requires no energy at all. All it requires is, so this, this, what they've done here is they, they, this is basically a glass of water, right? It's a beaker of water. They take a sugar cube and drop it in there. Now what this means is the sugar cube in, is in very, the sugar is in very high concentration where the sugar cube is. But, it, but there's no sugar anywhere else, of course. Now, the sugar cube starts to dissolve, or a salt tablet. I don't care, whatever you think of, whatever you want to dissolve in this water. The solvent is water. The solute is the thing that's going to dissolve in the water. So I'm, I'm saying sugar cube, right? The sugar will slowly, the sugar molecules will start to get surrounded by water molecules. And it will, we call this dissolving. This is the process that is chemically known as diffusion. Diffusion will continue until all of those sugar molecules are evenly spread throughout this water. Diffusion does not stop. You do the same thing when you spray a, uh, a nice smelling, you know, um, room deodorizer, room freshener, whatever. When you spray that in one part of the room, it will eventually diffuse throughout the whole room. You can, you can speed the process up a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about ways to do that. But that's called diffusion. Diffusion is a natural process. Diffusion applies to 
all of the things that are in, in, in physiology, all of the things that are dissolved in the water are the things that diffuse. So the take home message here is that solutes, that's the stuff that's dissolved in the water, solutes diffuse. And that's because those molecules move around through the water. All right. You need to understand that because chemically there's another process that we'll get to. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next slide. So now what they've done here is they've taken this whole diffusion idea to another level. <clears throat> you have to read questions like this. And I, I guarantee you there are test questions that I have that relate to this very topic. First off, we're going to look at the principle of diffusion. Now, this is an important point, and I cannot overemphasize this. This thing that says membrane is, is permeable to both water and solute. Okay, so I put this membrane in there. I have told you it is permeable to both. That means the water can go through the membrane, and the solutes can go through the membrane. If that's the case, when I start off, if I just put the solute, so let's say if I put my sugar cube only on side A, if I wait long enough, the sugar cube will dissolve, that becomes a solute, and it will evenly distribute itself across that membrane so that you have an even distribution of sugar on either side of the membrane. But I want to point out something to you. So we already understand the, pr the principles of diffusion. This red thing, which is the sugar in this case, is allowed to cross this membrane. Okay, it will. But also, some of this water will diffuse in the other direction. So both things move. Because, I want to emphasize this, I want to beat this into your heads. Because of this statement, the membrane is permeable to both. So both things will move. The water will move and the solute will move. Sol diffusion applies to the solute, but there's another name that we apply to the movement of water. Now, equilibrium, if they can both move, they both will move and they will sort themselves out in even distribution across that membrane eventually given enough time all right now next now diffusion works on natural principles that require no energy diffusion by definition means i am moving something from an area of high concentration of that solute to an area of low concentration of that same solute sugar cube is a perfect example high concentration of a sugar cube it eventually dissolves. It moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration of that same solute. Facilitated diffusion is a way that I can move something through a cell membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This is classic of how you get substances from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell. So out here, outside of the cell, there is a high concentration of whatever. Sugar. Let's say it's sugar. Okay? Because we used a sugar cube. We might as well say sugar. In the body's case, we'll say glucose. Glucose is a specific sugar. Okay? So we'll say glucose is in high concentration outside the cell membrane. But it's in low concentration on the inside of the cell membrane. Well, it wants to go through the cell membrane. But I told you, if sugar is not fat soluble and it is not and you want to prove this to yourself take some sugar out of your cupboard take some olive oil or vegetable oil put it in the put it in a glass pour the sugar on top of it spin it around for a while try to get it dissolved ain't happening you are not going to dissolve glucose or table sugar in oil the same thing applies here the glucose stays outside it can't get in how do you get it in you allow it in. You give it a channel. So something like this is a protein, and I told you before, there are transmembrane proteins. Proteins that 
sit inside the membrane, that span the membrane, and they are specific to allow glucose. There are other ones that allow sodium ions. There are other ones that allow potassium ions. There are other ones that allow chloride ions. All, there, there's all kinds of proteins that are specific to allow these solutes to travel from outside to inside or inside to outside. But they're going to follow their concentration gradient, which is why they are a passive process. Facilitated diffusion does not require ATP, no energy. All right, now I told you a solute can move. That's the thing that's dissolved in water. We just saw that, right? Sugar can move across the membrane if it's allowed. Any, anything dissolved in water will evenly distribute itself throughout the water given enough time. But remember I said too that water can also move. And water can move from one side of a membrane to the other side of the membrane. So it is allowed to move. The term that is applied to the movement of water is called osmosis. Please, in your head, make the differentiation between diffusion and osmosis. Diffusion applies to the thing that's dissolved in the water. Sugars, salts, other stuff. Anything that's dissolved in the water, that's diffusion. It will diffuse. The water itself moving is called osmosis. You have to understand, again, <laughs> I wrote the test. There are questions about this on the test, that you understand this difference. If my question says, water moves across the semi-permeable membrane, if the question is about water moving its osmosis, a solute moves across a semi-permeable membrane. If the solute is moving, it is diffusion. Again, this is a passive process because water can move on its own. It doesn't need ATP to move. We have a selectively permeable membrane here. But this time, this time, this membrane is selectively permeable, meaning, and I'm telling you, this is what has to be defined. The protein molecule cannot cross the membrane. So what we're saying is there is a, a protein in a higher concentration on one side of this membrane than the other side of the membrane. <clears throat> so I have water, I have water on each side, but I have protein only on one side. So uh, there's a little protein over here, but most of the protein is over here. A higher concentration of protein is over here. Now, if you think of diffusion, you would say, oh, well, the protein will diffuse to the other side because it wants to balance itself out. But I told you the protein cannot diffuse. It cannot move across the membrane. So this is a wall. That protein cannot go across. So it has to stay. But what can move? The water can move. If the water can move, that's called osmosis. And so now the water will try to dilute the more concentrated protein on the left side of your screen. So it will, right? The water can move. If the water can move, it will move. So it's going to move across from side B to side A, and it is going to try to dilute or even out the concentrations of protein on either side of that membrane. It's going to try. Whether it can or not depends on how concentrated things are. But it's going to try to do it, which means you're going to end up with more water on this side. Yes, this is actually what happens. You'd say, how can I possibly have more water over here and less water over here? It is because the water can move by osmosis, and it will try to dilute the more concentrated protein on side A. Now, you've got to give it some time to do that. No ATP. Passive process. Now, that when water moves, either direction, doesn't matter which way it moves, that is called osmotic pressure, or it creates what we call an osmotic gradient. So osmotic pressure is the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane.
and the pressure gradient will determine which way the water moves and it will determine what happens to the cell right so if i go backwards now if you start to think of this as a cell if you start to think of say let's say this is the inside of a cell and this is the outside of a cell rather than inside a beaker of water you're going to say oh well i got more protein inside the cell and i have less protein outside the cell and the protein can't go through the cell membrane because it's selectively permeable it doesn't allow the protein out so now my water wants to move in or you could imagine a situation in reverse where the water would want to move out yes you are thinking correctly this is exactly right water will move in or move out depending on its osmotic gradient and that creates what we call osmotic pressure so what does that mean these are red blood cells this is a normally shaped red blood cell up here in uh, in, in uh, box A. Now, red blood cells are weird shaped anyway. They're called biconcave discs. But this in A, this is a normal looking red blood cell. Okay, um, <clears throat> I took a brief break to blow my nose and I told you about the allergy things. It's information you didn't need to know, but I'm telling you anyway. All right, back to red blood cells. So we have red blood cells. Normal red blood cell looks like that one. Biconcave disc. It's a weird shape, but. So this red blood cell is in a solution that is, has the same salt concentration as the inside of the cell. Uh, that means that the saltiness or the sugar or whatever is inside and outside the cell are exactly the same concentration. That kind of solution is called an isotonic solution. So there is no net osmotic gradient, right? The osmotic pressure across the cell is zero. Water is not moving. It's not moving in or out. I mean, it's moving in and out at the same rate. So things do move, water moves. But again, this is a cell membrane and the cell membrane does not allow sodium to cross, potassium, chloride, sugar, I don't care what it is, proteins, doesn't allow it across. Okay, now, if we bathe this cell in what's called a hypertonic solution, so when we say hypertonic solution, we mean that there is more salt. The, the solution that this cell is in is saltier or has more sugar. Now, the salt's an easy way to think of it. It's saltier than the inside of the cell. If that's the case, if we have more salt on the inside of the cell, but remember I said this is a cell membrane, the solute cannot cross the membrane. Only the water can cross the membrane, and that is called osmosis. So the osmotic gradient, the osmotic pressure here is going to be for the water to leave the cell. As the water leaves the cell, there's less water left over in the cell. And so the cell adopts this crazy looking appearance. This is called a crenated cell, C-R-E-N-A-T-E-D, crenated. Crenated means the cell membrane, there's so little water in the cell now, that cell membrane is actually uh, forming over the top of the uh, microtubules that I mentioned as an organelle earlier on. So the so it's, it's the microtubules are kind of spiky, like your own skeleton is kind of spiky. If you lost a lot of water inside you, if you were dehydrated, severely dehydrated, your skeleton, your skin would adhere to your skeleton, and you'd look kind of spiky in places. I realize the analogy isn't perfect there, but that's the idea. Okay, so a hypertonic solution. More saltiness outside, less saltiness inside. The water can move, but the salt cannot move. So the water moves out. That is exactly the same situation as what we had here in the beaker. This is hypertonic over here on side A. Inside the cell, the water wants to leave the cell and go over to side A to dilute it. So there's less water inside the cell, more water outside the cell. Passive. 
Okay, <clears throat> now we're going to flip it around. Hypotonic. Hypotonic solution means there is less salt. The solution is less salty on the outside of the cell. Hypotonic. That means that it's more salty inside the cell. So water now, the osmotic pressure, the osmotic gradient, is that water wants to flow into the cell to dilute the, 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 the solute, the increased solute concentration inside the cell. Remember, it's very important. I'm going to say this. I know I'm beating a dead horse here. I get it. But the, the solute cannot move because the cell membrane doesn't let it move. The cell membrane only allows water to move. If water can move, water will move. If you have a hypotonic solution, the water will move into the cell. If you have a hypertonic solution, the water will move out of the cell. If you have an isotonic solution, there is no net movement of water in or out. The cell looks normal. Okay, the last passive process that we have to go through is this thing called filtration. Now you're used to filtration. You, if you, you make coffee, if you've ever made coffee in a coffee maker, right? You got a filter and uh, you put coffee in it and the water <clears throat> gets heated up and it gets poured through the, the filter onto the coffee. The coffee grounds stay behind. The water and the uh, coffee flavor, whatever comes through into the coffee, uh, that's what ends up in your glass, right? You filtered the coffee granules out of the coffee. Same process here. Uh, the only problem is in in human beings, we don't. Gravity is not the force that causes filtration in our bodies. Uh, the filtra filtration in our bodies is caused from what we call hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that your heart creates in your blood vessels. When your heart pumps, <clears throat> it pushes. And it pushes with a certain amount of force. And it pushes hard enough that it some of the stuff in your blood can push through the walls of the capillaries. You need that because the stuff that gets pushed out is usually nutrient stuff, right? You need sugars, you need proteins, you need fats. You need these things to get into the cells that are surrounding a capillary. So it, it requires a certain amount of push from your heart to do that. But it's still, the process is still called filtration. Again, it's a passive process. Doesn't require any energy. All right. Next up. Now we get into the active processes. So, when we're talking about active processes, what we really mean here is now we want to go against the gradient. We have to force things either into cells or out of cells that wouldn't naturally go in or out either by any of those other processes that we just talked about. If we have to move something against a concentration gradient, then you need active processes, and that means you need to use ATP. So, if I'm going to move anything across the cell membrane that is already in high concentration, either outside the cell or inside the cell, I have to push it. And a push means I need energy to push it. So a classic one is sodium will be in <clears throat> a certain concentration inside and outside the cell. Well, I want more sodium outside the cell, and there are reasons for this. We'll get to that. But if I want to push it out, against the concentration gradient, I have to put energy into it, and that process is called active transport. Active transport against a concentration gradient. Next up, another process that I can get things out of a cell with energy is I can, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, endo, I'm, I'm sorry, exocytosis is the next one. Endocytosis is bringing something into the cell, sorry, using energy. So if I have something outside the cell that I want to bring into my cell, I need to move it in. <clears throat> I can put a membrane around it. So this is, think of a, a, a white blood cell engulfing a bacterium. If it engulfs, engulfs the bacterium, it's going to put it inside a vesicle. 
and we'll say if this is a lysosome, if there are lysosomes, there, there'll be enzymes inside that vesicle that will destroy this particle. So that is called endocytosis. I'm bringing something into the cell from outside to inside by circling around it, putting some cell membrane around it, and bringing it into the cell. There are actually <clears throat> different ways to do this, and depending on the substance that you're bringing into the cell. If you're bringing in, now this is weird, if you're bringing in droplets of a liquid, this is sometimes how cells actually bring water into the cell, which is kind of an odd thought process. But there are other substances, other chemicals, other fluids that it will bring in. If it brings in a fluid, a liquid of some sort, that is called pinocytosis. Now, if I'm bringing in something bigger, a solid particle, like a bacteria or a protein, that's called phagocytosis. So phago means to eat. And pino means, as you might imagine, means to drink. All right, so if my cell is drinking, it's pinocytosis. If my cell is eating something, it's called phagocytosis. There's a third way, this thing called receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is a bunch of big words. It means that I have a receptor, and a receptor is something uh, it's kind of like uh, you have to think of a a, uh, a radio. I know that's a little old-fashioned, you know, but if you have a radio, you can tune the radio to a specific radio frequency, right? So I want to listen to, let's say, I want to listen to some radio station, and I have to dial the radio to that particular frequency, and then I can hear that radio station. Your cells are kind of like that, too. On the outside of the cell, it will have a receptor that is specific for a particular molecule. Not any other molecule, just one special molecule. Once it finds that molecule, that molecule will bind to the receptor. And then the cell will bring in whatever is bound to the receptor into the cell. That specific thing, not just like any old bacteria, not just like any old protein or any old drop of liquid, a very specific chemical. So that's called receptor mediated endocytosis. Specific things bind to the receptors. Once they bind, then the cell brings it inside. So there's a picture of that. <clears throat> if I have down here is receptor mediated endocytosis. So I have a receptor, so we, we they they show you that by having this little purpley thing. And the purpley thing only binds to the red molecules here, but not to the green ones and not to the yellow ones. So when it binds to the red ones, it is brought into the cell, endocytosis. We would say it's engulfed by the cell. But it's a specific molecule. Whereas up here, you have any old bacteria or any old, you know, thing that you want to bring into the cell, non-specific. All right. Now, endocytosis is bringing something into the cell. Exocytosis is spitting it out of the cell. I gave you the example earlier of insulin. This is how insulin gets out of the cell. The cell makes a bunch of insulin, packages it up in a vesicle, and then spits it out. But that takes energy, so it has to be worth it for the cell to do that. Another good example is neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are made by nerve cells, and they are packaged in vesicles. And then when you want to send the neurotransmitter out of the cell, you do it by exocytosis. Very common. It takes energy. There's one more, one more way that takes energy, but that you can move things through a cell against the concentration gradient. That is called transcytosis. <clears throat> transcytosis is simply moving something from one side of a cell to the other side of the cell, bringing it in on one side of the cell, spitting it out on the other side of the cell. So it's both endocytosis on one side, and exocytosis on the other side. Both of these require energy. Uh, they use the example here of moving a virus. This is called the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. 
that causes a disease called AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. The way the AIDS virus can move across the cell and you become infected. This is the way that you become infected by HIV, is that it actually move, moves through the cell by transcytosis from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. Well, the other side of the cell would be inside your body. So yeah, you're infected now. So that's called transcytosis. Energy, needs energy. Okay, now the third part. We are done with part two of chapter four. Right, part one was organelles. Part two was <clears throat> getting things in and out of cells. Part three is now a cell must replicate itself. That's part of life, right? Part of the definition of living things, the way we define them, is that the cell can replicate itself. And how it does that is it has a cell cycle. There's a cycle in which the cell lives. It does certain things. You have a cycle. You have a daily cycle, right? You go to bed, you get up, you have breakfast, you drive to school, you drive to work, you take care of your kids or you take care of yourself or whatever you're doing. And then you come home and you study. You study a lot because, you know, because that's good for you. Uh, you exercise because that's also good for you. And then you go to bed again, right? And so you have this cycle, this daily cycle. So do cells. Cells do the, the same kinds of things. They just, uh, their cycles are obviously a little bit different than yours. There are <clears throat> three big phases in which cell lives. Uh, interphase is the, is the cell doing its cell stuff. So a kidney cell is doing kidney cell things, and a heart cell is doing heart cell, and a lung cell, and a brain cell. All these cells are doing the thing that we we expect them to do and we imagine that they're doing. But that's, that's during the process called interphase. But most cells want to or need to replicate. They need to uh, make take one cell and make two cells out of that. That process is called mitosis. Now that's part of the cell cycle. And once you go through mitosis, when you're almost done with mitosis, cytokinesis is simply the last part of mitosis where the cell actually, literally, physically divides itself into those two, what we call daughter cells. So it lives in interphase most of the time, most of the stuff that it's doing. If it's gonna divide, it's gotta do some things to get ready to divide, and then it's going to go through mitosis, and then it's going to do its thing again, right? It's going to be a nerve cell or a, you know, a lung cell or kidney cell or whatever. It's going to do its thing. <clears throat> Some cells reproduce very, very frequently. Other cells reproduce more slowly. Some cells don't reproduce at all. Well, we're not talking about those cells because we're talking about mitosis. So here it is broken up. Right after a cell divides, we're going to get into these, into the phases of mitosis. But <clears throat> after a cell has gone through mitosis, the first part, the first part of its doing its stuff is called the G1 phase. Now this is part of interphase. It's part of interphase. But this is it doing its stuff. So your kidney cell and your heart cell are doing heart and kidney cell things. And they don't divide when they're doing that stuff. And they're kept in check, which, call, which is called the restriction point. They're held here in G1 while they're doing their thing. But if you need more of these cells, for whatever reason, whatever stimulus there is to make more of these cells, uh, the next part of that is called S phase. S phase is where your DNA is doubled. If you're going to have two cells, you got to have twice as much of everything, right? So DNA in particular has to be uh, replicated, and it has to be replicated exactly right, exactly correctly. That happens during the S phase. All right, so it doubles its DNA, and now G2, that stands for growth. G2 
G2 stands for growth, growth two or growth second phase. Here's growth first phase. Growth second phase is, uh, it does other things getting ready to go through mitosis. <laughs> we won't get into all the, soup, the details there. And then after G2, then it enters into what we call mitosis specifically. Mitosis is made of four phases. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Should I go on? No, you probably don't want me to. PMAT. PMAT is, is a good way to remember that. PMAT. Always in that order. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. There are distinct things that happen during these portions of mitosis. So interphase, I told you DNA doubles very active period in the cell cycle. The cell grows, gets bigger, gets more mature, <clears throat> still maintains its normal functions, but it does an additional thing. It replicates the DNA. So you've got one copy of all of the DNA, the whole thing. Now we're gonna double it because we're gonna make two cells in the end, right? Uh, the cell can synthesize new organelles, membranes, biochemicals to, re to prepare for division. Now, we would like to think the purpose of mitosis is to create two identical cells. You start with one cell that has certain stuff in it. You want two of those cells that has exactly the same stuff in it. The only thing that we can say for sure that will be exactly the same is the DNA. Everything else, we would like it to double. We would like, you know, if we had four mitochondria, I mean, you really have more than that, but if you had four mitochondria in the one cell that started off, you would like to have two mitochondria in each of the daughter cells. And it doesn't exactly work out perfectly that way all the time, but the DNA is doubled perfectly. Okay, so <clears throat> G1 and G2 are growth phases, gap phases, sometimes called. Synthesis is, synthesis means we're synthesizing DNA. It's replicated during the synthesis phase. All right. Now, we're going to get into mitosis now. Now we've doubled our DNA. We're ready to go. Okay? Mitosis is the process of actually division of the nucleus and movement of the new of the copies of DNA into the new cells. Cytokinesis is actually the division of the cytoplasm, which is a, a, almost the very last step. <clears throat> in the process of mitosis. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. So in prophase, you've already got double DNA, but it's all coily. It's all over the place. You have to organize that DNA. All right. You organize it now to form, you organize the chromatin, the doubled chromatin. It condenses to form chromosomes. This is what you're used to seeing. You're used to seeing chromosomes, right? They, they look like an X. When you, when you look at chrome, well, I'll show you some pictures. But when you see chromosomes, or when we say, oh, look, it's DNA, this is doubled up DNA in the form of chromosomes that has been highly condensed, really, really smushed down to a very small package. <clears throat> You've doubled up centrioles. Remember those organelles? Those centrioles, one, now one new pair of centrioles moves to one side of the cell. The other pair of centrioles moves to the other side of the cell, right? These are going to be the key places that are going to pull the doubled DNA, one copy into one cell, one copy into the other cell. That happens during prophase. Now, the nuclear envelope, and I told you DNA stays inside the nucleus all the time, except now. Prophase, the nucleus, the nuclear envelope, will start to break down. All right, next step, metaphase. Metaphase, uh, meta, think of M meaning middle. The DNA, the duplicated DNA, lines up in the middle of the cell. M for middle. <clears throat> in anaphase, the doubled up chromosomes each you know, the, the the pairs of chromosomes now come apart and they're pulled into opposite directions into the new cells. That happens during anaphase. Telophase, the condensed uh, 
chromosomes now start to disperse again and they be, they go back to their chromatin structure and the nuclear envelope forms around the new DNA in each cell. All right, so let's look at some pictures. Oh, of course we have to have charts. Here it is described in charts. I always tell people, print this off, put it under your pillow. Maybe it will absorb into your brain um, naturally. Here it is in pictures. Okay, so we start off with a cell. Here's a nucleus. Now we're already into, we're getting, we're getting really close to getting into prophase because we've doubled the DNA. We've doubled up our centrioles. <laughs> so we have two centrioles. But we still have a nuclear envelope. It's still intact. So we really haven't quite gotten into prophase yet. Now we get into prophase. The nuclear envelope breaks down. We have condensed chromosomes. We get centrioles. Each centriole moves into its opposite side, getting ready for cell division. <clears throat> in late prophase, those chromosomes will start to line up in the middle. They get closer and closer and closer to the middle. Once they're in the middle, like this, when they line up in the middle, you are now in metaphase. Metaphase middle. Okay, the next phase is anaphase. Anaphase is where these chromosomes that line up in the middle that are doubled, they get pulled apart from each other. One set goes into one cell, one set goes into the other cell. It is the centriole that does that work through the work of microtubules that are pulling those chromosomes apart. See, then you get... Uh, one copy of the chromosomes in one cell, the other copy of the chromosomes is in the other cell. Now you're getting into, uh, you're in anaphase here. You haven't quite gotten to telophase, but you're getting close. Now telophase starts to form that new nuclear membrane. Here's the centromeres, I'm sorry, the centrioles in each side of the cell. And now you're going to get this thing we call a cleavage furrow. That is the kicker for cytokinesis, when we are dividing the plasma, the cytoplasm, into two. That's called cytokinesis. Once cytokinesis is done, now you have two identical cells where you had one when you started off. That's the point of mitosis. Two identical cells in every possible way, as close to perfectly double as you can possibly get. So you have PMAT, P, M, A, T. <clears throat> now they're in interphase. Off they go again. That's it in a nutshell. Cytoplasmic division, cytokinesis. That's the last part when you start to get that cleavage furrow in, on, in the middle of these two new cells. That is cytokinesis. There is a ring of actin filaments that grabs around, pinches around the middle of this thing, and literally squeezes it down. Last step. And you get two identical cells. We're all done. That's it. And speaking of all done, we're all done. This, I think, this is the last slide in this in this thing. So we've been through the three things, the three big things that you have to understand about Chapter Four: organelles. Cellular organelles, what their purpose is, how they work, what do they do? Not all cells have all organelles in the same quantity. Number two, uh, we talked about how things get in and out of cells. There are active processes and passive processes. Water can move. If water moves, it's called osmosis. If solutes move, the things that are dissolved in water, if they move, that's called diffusion. You can have active or passive processes there. You can review those. Third thing in, in here is mitosis. How does mitosis work? What are the phases of mitosis? And that is incorporated into something called the cell cycle. That is the end of chapter four. I may uh, put some other videos up related to chapter four. Um, yeah, actually, there's, actually, there's another there's another part of chapter four that I have to get into, which is RNA and DNA. Oh, hello. My dog just showed up. RNA and DNA and protein synthesis. And I will do that on another video. So thanks for your patience. Uh, I'll see you on the next video.